Hi, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. This is the first video in a multi-part series on architectural model making. I've had a lot of requests for this recently and I thought I'd dig into it. One of the driving forces behind my desire to become an architect from a very young age was model making. Architecture was one of the few professions where sketching and constructing scale models out of cardboard and balsa, what I essentially viewed as playing, was not only acceptable, but encouraged. Architectural models have near universal appeal. Yet they're often viewed by the uninitiated as purely representational objects, which is to say, a precise depiction of a physical reality. Although highly detailed and accurate renditions are a subset of architectural models, they're actually less useful to architects. In practice, we construct models for a variety of reasons that extend beyond pantomiming reality. From small-scale massing models of vast urban environs to a highly detailed quarter-scale replica of material connections, Models extend our understanding of how architecture and materials can shape our world. And they come at a fraction of the cost and time of constructing the real thing. They allow us to quickly test and refine multiple versions of a concept. And perhaps most importantly, they're a form of three-dimensional sketching. They help in the ideation process, forming new ideas by smashing parts and pieces together. This is a concept in the modeling world known as kit bashing, but more on that later. Now, I assumed entering architecture school that there would be courses to teach me how to make models, but I was wrong. And I think this is the common experience for most architecture students. Model making 101 just doesn't exist, and it's the reason the first year section of an architecture school has the largest first aid kit. Exacto blades, little sleep, and deadlines mean many cut fingers. I didn't escape my first year without a notable scar either, and it's one which I carry to this day as a reminder of those times. Although there's some shared hive knowledge that's passed around the studio, this trial by fire forces experimentation and adaptation. Even the greenest of architecture students quickly develops a signature style of model making, and it's one that evolves and follows the professional throughout their career. Like sketching, the means, methods, and materials architects utilize define this signature style. We'll explore this in detail in future videos, but it's enough to know that models don't always describe finished, well-resolved buildings, often just the opposite. The most interesting models to me are snapshots of an architect's thought process, the inspiration behind a project, abstract and gestural. In this way, they're useful for critiques by colleagues, other professionals, or clients. It's neither possible nor desirable to portray every last doorknob or floor finish in each space, and it's this room for critical interpretation that's an essential quality of what architects call study models. Often, I'll begin my design process by building a series of physical, rather than computer-generated, sketch study models to test ideas. These are loose and imperfect and made quickly. Most non-professionals wouldn't refer to an architect's study model as a model at all. But to an architect, it's as evocative as any finished presentation model might be. For each of these videos, I'll try to outline a few macro concepts and also some of the micro details which convey my experience constructing models, teaching you things that work for me, and have come to define my personal model making style. So macro tip number one is to define the purpose. When you determine exactly what you're trying to achieve, the next questions you'll face become much easier to answer. Things like the size and scale of the model, or what materials you'll source. Scale and size naturally determine the level of detail required. A model constructed at 1 500th scale versus one at 1 inch equals a foot show fundamentally different information. Likewise, the materials used to construct a city block versus those to build a handrail detail will also be different. Using rigid foam to model city blocks is a sensible choice. It's easy to work with, and because you'll need a lot of it, it's inexpensive as compared to other alternatives. However, it would be completely inappropriate to build a 1 8 scale wall plane out of foam because for this purpose, it's far too thick and it lacks the detail necessary. Some examples of a model's purpose? Massing or small scale models. These describe a building's mass or shape. Urban planning, skyscrapers, large commercial developments, campus planning. They depict building form. Study models. Here, a variety of scales are possible and sizes. These are used to quickly study concepts and ideas. A presentation model. Sales tools. They're used for fundraising or corporate client work. A daylighting model to study the effect exterior openings have on interior spaces and daylighting scenarios. A detail model. Describing complex connections, spatial relationships, or structural details. And then there are material models showing how materials interact and what they actually look like next to each other. 
The purpose of a model determines how accurately one must depict the building in color and material. Detail is usually directly correlated to scale. The larger the model, in scale terms, the more detail required to be convincing and useful. This also relates to color, which we'll cover separately. The more detailed the modeling goal, the more likely you'll need scale drawings to work from. A large scale cross-sectional model will describe a specific set of relationships and proportions. You'll probably want to begin with scale documents and dimensions, then pivot to alternate solutions as the model suggests new alternatives. If the goal is to conceptualize in three dimensions, these types of models should be loose and free form, and thus no drawings are necessary. In general terms, for study models, you'll want to use readily available, non-precious, and inexpensive materials. The idea is to rip and tear, remove, reattach, destroy, and recombine. In the next video, we'll cover my favorite model building materials, basic tools, and time-saving shortcuts. I'll leave you as promised with a micro tip to complement the macro we began with. Think about your model as a narrative. In the absence of a verbal presentation given by you, what can your model say for you? Do parts move? Consider modeling open windows or doors. Perhaps add lighting. Are there designed furniture elements or objects within? Each of these can be convincing if they contribute to a narrative rather than acting as gimmicks. Because all architecture is viewed in relation to the human scale, any means of describing our relationship to it is important. Show elements that describe how people will move through or use the space. Depict scale figures in motion in the model to remind the viewer of this. For me, this often inspires new ideas. Adding a ladder to this conceptual model inspired a new set of ideas related to accessing a roof element and a potential new direction for the study model. For the casual viewer, it's a mysterious gesture, just as the open panels with their counterweight. It provokes thought, and it can lead to novel solutions.